Life means something is purpose, a goal, the battle, the struggle, you know, even if you don't win it. When my doctor declared me unfit to give testimony in the Watergate trial, everybody thought I'd be relieved. Well, they were wrong. That was the lowest I got. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Our guest is in the show of the season, conjuring up and reinterpreting Richard Nixon. Here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Susan and I are great, great fans of Frank Langella. He's really one of the great stage actors. Brilliant performance now as Richard Nixon in Frost Nixon on Broadway at the Jacobs Theater. Very happy that it's brought him to Theater Talk tonight. Welcome back, Frank, I think for your third appearance. Third, thank you. And congratulations on a wonderful, wonderful performance. Thank you. I also want to congratulate you because it's just been announced that you're going to be doing the movie, the Frost yes. Nixon movie. Yeah. Now, there was a lot of talk about all other minor actors getting that uh, part. How did you pull that one out of the hat? I just kept my head down. I think that's what really did it. I just worked. I just did the work. So, uh, I mean, just you, through sheer brilliance of your performance, you uh, swung the movie in your favor. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, it's, um, it's actually a very thrilling thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's happened to me twice. It happened, With Dracula? It happened on Dracula, and it happened on this. And I, I think very few Broadway actors ever get to play the part in the movie, so that, I'm very grateful. Does that bother the Broadway actors who create these parts, though, and then suddenly, you know... No, go, Michael, they all think... <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, they, they're so happy when someone else takes it away from them, you know? This, this reminds me of this story. Of, uh, I think Joan Rivers told it. She was sitting with Carol Channing as, as she saw the movie of Hello, Dolly, yes. and that as it went on, she got more and more happy and more and more gracious. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol Channing actually told me that when Ma Marilyn Monroe was cast in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, she came to see her like 30 times and came all the way up to her dressing room, which was three floors up, and said, Miss Channing, I've, I've learned so much from watching you. I'm going to go to Hollywood and really try to do as good a job. And Carol said, oh, she was so lovely. She had no idea. I just wanted to push her right down those stairs. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> wonderful. <laughs> yeah. um, how did you um, how, how did you get involved in, in, in Frost Nixon? I got a telephone call from Michael Grandage, the director. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Now April, I think of two thousand six. We're in two thousand seven. Yeah? yeah, April or so of two thousand six. And he said, "I'm going to send you a script." Um, uh, Peter Morgan and I just saw Good Night and Good Luck, the film, and we'd mm -hmm. like to know if you'd like to play Nixon. And I read it, and I was otherwise engaged. I was contracted to something else. Mm -hmm. So it took about three or four weeks. After my initial reservation, um, not, I'm not being disingenuous, because actors always say, oh, I turned it down, I turned it down. I didn't turn it down. I just said, I'm not certain this is in my bag of Why? tricks. Well, because I don't know whether you know this, but I can be theatrical on the stage. <laughs> And I can be expansive, and it's both been wonderfully accepted and criticized. I'm, you know, I'm Italian by nature, and I'm theatrical by nature. As an actor, I am. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that would be, you know, of course, the antithesis of what Nixon should be. What I wanted to do mostly was um, accept the challenge of something unlike anything I'd ever done before. Yeah. And that's why I finally said yes, which is, I don't think I can do this. And, and indeed, in the first ten days of rehearsal in London, I really thought I'd made a mistake. I thought, I don't know that I can find all the imploded internal. So I called someone extremely close to me and told her I thought I should really get out of this. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you know, do, do, this, do a speech for me on the phone. So London to New York, I did one of the arias. And at the end of it, she said, my God, you're terrible. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and it was such a, the right thing to say to me. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah, she yeah. just she yeah. just challenged me. Peter Morgan was here, and he said that you built the character very slowly. That very Michael Sheen had his whole character bump, popping, pizzazz, and they, yeah. but that you slowly, slowly, slowly. But that's built it up. that's been true of me with other characters as well. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly don't. I try very hard in rehearsal not to do anything that isn't happening to me organically. Because right. I know I can jump fast to something either theatrical or, or um, 
slicker, if that's the word. Yeah, I mean, you've got your bag of yes, tricks you can I've reach got, into. I, and I don't want to do it, because especially the older you get, the more, um, the more you trust to chance, I think, as you get older, the more you are actually, I'm not saying this correctly, in fact, you should think as you get older as an actor, I can't do this, I don't know how to do this, I'm in a wilderness, what's going to happen next? The actors I don't enjoy watching are ones who have come to nail down their thing. Right. right. And then you, every time you go, you, you see. see that familiar thing. And they don't grow and they don't expand. It's interesting that you say your f initial reaction to Nixon was because you are theatrical and you didn't think of Nixon that way. And yet, your performance is wonderfully theatrical in the sense of the use of your hands, as Nixon does so much, you know, which I hadn't remembered Nixon doing, but I've gone back and looked at tapes, and his hands, they're yes. their own entities, they are, almost. Yeah. He, was, he, he's, he, he is the most fascinating character I've ever played, and I've played a lot of great, great guys. But he's almost like a marionette, you know, yeah. his hands look like someone's pulling them up from somewhere else, and his legs go a particular way, and his shoulders go. He's a wonderfully, wonderfully rewarding uh, Inspiration. You had that wonderful, really wonderful aria, um, the, the, the phone call scene mm. at the end. And you and I discussed this, but I, I really find it fascinating because you have the marionette Nixon moving the hands and all that. But when you deliver this monologue, where up to this point we've seen Nixon be very witty and charming and clever, and this is the dark Nixon that comes out in this one moment, you play it with your hands yeah. in your pockets. How That's did you a, settle on that? Um, it's it's what I call the lucky accident. Really, is um, come into rehearsal with no preset notions in your head, and even in performance, change it as you go within the confines of what's uh, artistically correct for the play. But don't ever fall in love with anything to the point where you think that's the only way to do it. There are dozens of ways to do it, mm -hmm. and it never occurred to me. And I remember saying to to Michael Grandage don't let me carry a telephone because if you let me carry a telephone you're going to limit me I'm going to have to hold the phone yeah. and hold the phone and I won't be able to gesture and I don't know how it happened I don't really I one night I remember at, at half hour I said look I'm going to try the whole thing with my hands in my pockets I don't think I'll make it <laughs> I said I just don't think I'll make it but let's see what happens and then of course it was instantly right yeah. for me and then it seemed to be right for the audience and now nothing could get them out of my pocket. <laughs> it's just Nobody. a remarkable, te yeah. t technically it's such a remarkable yeah. moment because all Again, of the it, it's a lucky accident yeah. but it probably came out of the long slow process of finding Nixon and I'm still finding him. He changed quite dramatically in New York from London. He became a deeper, darker character because the American audiences really wanted him to go in the direction of the cliche of him, right? You know? mm -hmm. And I had to, and I had to resist a tendency to do that anyway. You did a, an awful lot of research for this part. I remember you telling me you went out to um, Yorba Linda, mm -hmm. the the Nixon Library. Um, what 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 sorts of things did you do out there? What did you read? What did you see? What uh... I sat alone in his house. The people who run his library, his house is right there. The little house that he grew up in, the right underneath is, the lemon tree. That I believe that his parents bought from Sears. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. And um, they asked me if I wanted to go upstairs to see his bedroom. So I said yes, and they said, well, the stairway's over there. And I went around a corner, and it was a little stairway about that now. My shoulders just hit the walls. And when I went upstairs, it was a tiny room with eaves like that, two beds, two single beds, a small window. Four boys had grown up there until two of his brothers died of tuberculosis. And I sat on the bed, and I thought, this is where the President of the United States grew up, in this tiny, small, I mean really small, smaller than even my first little studio apartment in New York, tiny, tiny space. And uh, it informed a great deal of my feelings about him. It, it, um, it began, that moment, sitting there alone in that little house, was the beginning for me of wanting to understand his nature more mm. than anything else. Not his politics, mm -hmm. not his illegality, not his, uh, the vicious things he did in the Alger Hiss case and the Helen Gehagen Douglas and all the things that we've all come to feel about him.
And it was there that I sort of resolved that I would um, try very hard to find this human being more than anything else. Yeah, I was going to ask you, before taking on this part, you were around, what yeah. were you bringing to, what, what were your prejudices about Nixon coming into it? As much as all of us, I was as much a victim of the sound bite and the cliché and the shaking jowls and the V sign and the awful things he did. And I, I was a young man in Williamstown, Massachusetts when he, uh, doing a play in Summerstock when he resigned and I watched it and I got up and went to rehearsal and thought, oh, there's that old, that crook, old crooked guy. <laughs> All right, and, so you're talking about there's that old right, crooked guy. Right, exactly. And then, of course, um, he's taught me a great deal about um, judgment. He's taught me a great deal about um, the limitations we put on ourselves and each other. You know, someone gets to be, and it's worse now today than it was 30 years ago. We judge people on one thing and they can't get out of it. You know, Imus will forever be just a bigot. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he's very, very many complicated things that you can admire and dislike. And Anna Nicole Smith is just a dumb blonde. In fact, she's a whole panoply of insane things. And Nixon, I watched him, as I told you last night, playing the piano on an old Jack Parr show. Yeah. He was sweet and funny and lovely and, and, um, and rather relaxed. It, that doesn't mean you forgive what he did. Right, it because mean, it, it's yeah. too bad his first instinct was, his first instinct was always to be that crooked guy. Exactly, and that's, yeah. the, that's the thing, the irony yeah. you bring to it, that here's this. Well, it came out of the, the things I began to intuit then I went across the street to his library and I sat at his desk for the whole day and the staff brought me his own personal notes scribbled on mm -hmm. the sides of pages. His favorite book was a book by um, de Charles de Gaulle yeah. called The Edge of the Sword yeah. and I read his liner notes on that. What sort and of things did he write? In yes, the must do this. This is right. I, I, yes, mm -hmm. must be more this way. De Gaulle would write, this is how a leader walks into the room. This is how a leader fires a subordinate. This is how a leader convinces his people he believes in something his, he doesn't. One must be decisive, one must be... The thing about Nixon that is, was fascinating to me was how much he wanted to be a great man. Mm -hmm. How he had immortal yearnings, so to speak, I've said this before, how deeply he wanted to be great. He wanted to be a great statesman. He wanted so to be a great statesman. He so admired De Gaulle and all that. But when, at the drop of a hat, he's going to turn around and say, "Let's get, let's get those people. Let's bug that yeah. place. Let's get that money." I mean, yeah. you know, because he was having Bagman bringing money to him through his old administration. Yeah. He didn't ever question that side of himself that was well, so oriented around. He couldn't, value. as a lot of people can. You know, we all see people like this all the time. Why is that person doing that to themselves? Yes. Why, why is a truly successful great actor a big drunk and you got to pull him out of the dressing room? <laughs> why is why is an actress, you know, stretching her face beyond recognition when she's got so much else to go for? It's the voice in the head that came from when you were young, saying, "You know what? You don't have any right to this. Mm. You have you." You, you don't belong up here. You don't belong on this rung of the ladder. You belong further down. So unconsciously, you whack yourself down. Then you tell yourself somebody else did it. But you did it to yourself. And the thing I've come to realize about him, as I do about all of us, is, is the little voice in the head is the one that rules you until you, until you exorcise it in a way until you face it. Have you done this personally in your life, in your yeah. career? Oh, sure. What was yeah. that little voice in your head telling you about for years that you, it was holding you back or that you sort of were able to I, exercise I, it? I don't think, and I'm, I don't really believe I'm an unusual actor. I really believe that most actors become actors because there is a desperate need, desperate, not just the normal need, but a desperate need to be loved, to be paid attention to, to be embraced, to be accepted, to be wanted, mm -hmm. to, as Nixon says, the people whose respect we really wanted, really craved. And actors, more than, uh, should I say average folk, but <laughs> actors tend more to, to need that more than people who don't want to get out in the light. Actors and politicians. Exactly.
Mm. And where did that come from in you? The family you grew up in? I mean, you came from a fairly large? Yes, I came from a big Italian-American family. And so you were competing to, for the limelight all the no, time with I'm brothers not, and sisters? I'm not going to tell you where it came from in me because it's my <laughs> secret. <laughs> and every actor should have a secret. We were talking earlier to Vanessa Redgrave, actually, and uh, who, when she did Long Day's Journey and Tonight, was notorious for changing it all the time and being unpredictable, which was very mm -hmm. exciting to some of her co-stars like Brian Dennehy uh, and Philip Seymour Hoffman, but would upset other actors. No. Do, uh, and do you think it's a valid criticism that she shouldn't do that? I mean, to me, that's the most exciting acting to see, like she does and you do, that there's always something creative going on. Well, look, you have colleagues, and it's a profession, and you have uh, standards and discipline. Within that framework, within the framework of, of what the structure of the play is and how the director has staged it and, what, and out of the respect you have for your colleagues, you can leap as much as you want as long as you don't leap over them, mm. past them, or <laughs> on, on them. them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although it's been so I've enjoyed leaping on. But still, most of the time, I think it's exciting to other actors. If you do it in, an, in, a, in, a, in a respectful, artful way, yeah. it's exciting. It keeps the night alive. Otherwise, why, I don't know, why go out there to repeat it? Yeah. Yes. What you should do is go out there to discover it anew every single night. Yeah. The, I, I remember when I was growing up, there was a very, very famous actor whom I admired, and I went back to see him, and uh, he said, you know, I've got it down now where I can do my laundry list while I'm on stage. Oh, I can, Who I was can this? Plan, I, I will say, he's a <laughs> really wonderful actor. Still alive? No, he's, yeah. he's long since died. And I, I was, even then, I was sort of surprised by that. I thought, well, why don't you just enjoying what you're saying at the moment you're saying it, mm -hmm. rather than going on automatic. And then when I left the theater and I thought back to his performance, I thought, oh, I can see that. <laughs> and I think an audience sees it. Yes, I think an can. audience knows when you're out there for their pleasure, when you really want to be there. Every night I try so hard to do that, to be there for them. Mm -hmm. Not for me, but to be the conduit for what the author wants them to feel. Mm -hmm. And then it takes away all self-consciousness, too. As a young actor, you're always thinking, how, how am I coming off? How do I look? Is this? And then once you tell yourself, I am the playwright's uh, vessel, yeah. you're free of nerves. It's interesting. So, Vanessa, Vanessa had said, she said, I'm the violin that Joan Didion plays on and um, yeah. uh, David Hare plays on. Oh, well, then I'm the cello. Yeah. <laughs> so what does Peter Morgan want the audience to feel about Nixon? Do they want them to feel the sympathy we feel, the sadness? Uh, Peter Morgan, I think, wants um, the audience to see the two men who are in the same place in life, both... The other David Frost, the yes, British interviewer. as he yeah. says, in the dirt. In the dirt. Two men who were told they were nothing, two men who came from modest circumstances, who were um, unsuccessful and then successful and then found themselves on the skids, needed each other, mm. needed, a, a, you know, a pact made in hell. Uh, each of them using the other to climb up out of the mire of their failure. And at some point, as my character says, only one of us can win. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael's character says that. I say the, uh, if it'll be the wilderness. Only one of other, us can yeah. be in the limelight and the other will be in the wilderness. You, you get the sense, or I get the sense watching you play this, this particular version of Richard Nixon, that he has made the decision to let David Frost win that he could have decided not to let David Frost win and he would have carried on and Frost would have been yeah. in the wilderness. Is that a fair interpretation of what, what it's, you're doing? It's one, and it's uh, the sort of thing I never ever cop to because I still want the audience to Two. not know. I yeah. still want them to decide for themselves. If you decided that, that's fine. Someone else might think I was pulled into the confession. Someone else might think, you know, I, I manipulated it in order to do that. I like an audience not to know too much about what it is I, I'm trying to do so that they just take home with them a visceral reaction. You've had, uh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, when you, at the, towards the end you were projected on the screen, uh, yeah. on, on a screen very large above you, and I, I, I wondered, when you're doing that, is it strange to you to have the sense that people are looking at you on the screen 
Versus no, because I, I, I made a pact with the director that I would never, never, ever look or know. I do know there is one long, slow close-up, and yeah. I, know, I know that because I have to aim my head a particular way to catch the, the, the freeze. But other than that, no, mm. I just assume you're looking at me. Mm. I just assume. It's very interesting because you're looking at you both at the same time. Yeah. It's a very interesting theatrical yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, device yeah. that's done. You've had a great life in the theater, and uh, I'm waiting for your memoir at some point. Now, mm. you've told me you are uh, sort of a secret scribbler that you all have been writing yeah. uh, a lot of things down. You're going to do a series of essays on some of the great actors yeah. that you've known? I started my... Uh, Memoir sounds like such a grand word, doesn't it? <laughs> what should I call it? My reminiscences, my biography. I started it many, many years ago. While my mind is really sharp and clear, I wanted to put down things. But I found, and, and again, I'm not being disingenuous, I found I became incredibly disinterested in recording. I was in this play. Yeah. I, you know, I did this happened. This didn't get good reviews. This did. I won something. I didn't. And then I went on to. It just, it bored me. But what excited me was when I would begin to write about an experience with Joe Van Fleet mm -hmm. or Mildred Dunnick or Anne Bancroft or Laurence Olivier, George C. Scott, Jason Robarts, Colleen Dewhurst, all of these people that I'd worked with. I found that I, I couldn't stop writing my memories of them. Mm -hmm. and, and then I expanded it to people outside the theater. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I would do a book about that. I just, this is what it was like to be working with, in a room with, have a relationship with, have a feud with, have a love affair with, a fight with, these extraordinary people that I've been lucky enough to have dealt with since I was 20 years old when I first came to New York. And then I couldn't stop writing. When I was 17, I was in a summer stock company and there were two women in a play called Anastasia that very few people know anymore called Billy Darvish and Dolores Del Rio. Oh, yeah. Dolores, Dolores Del, Del Rio, Rio was one of the great Mexican beautiful actresses, and Lily was Molnar's widow and a, an actress in her own right. And I wrote down what it was like to be 17, sitting in a prompter's booth, watching these two great women of that time play Anastasia, and Lily saying, you ever prompt me, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it, it then goes towards... Um, people who've passed away recently, like Arthur Miller, whom I spent a, a year with. Right, when you did um, after the last. The fall. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, after. Are the you going to write about Alan Bates? Yes, I already have written about Alan. But the, the thing is, you have, to have, you have to be dead to be in this book. It's, <laughs> it's all about those people who've left us. And uh, someone gave me a great piece of advice about writing, which is that you should always write and give the reader something that they couldn't learn from anybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That if you were alone in a room with that person, only you could be telling them this, and that's what I've been trying to do. Can you give us uh, just one little sample, maybe Arthur Miller, something about him that... Uh... Arthur and I spent um, dozens and dozens of evenings together working on After the Fall. My then wife would cook us a meal. After we ate, we'd go into my study, and he, we'd start talking about the play. And he began to, and I, I took notes with Arthur the minute he left. I, I didn't always do that, but I ran and took all notes. He told me that um, one night Marilyn tried to uh, kill herself yet again, and they were in a hiding out somewhere in Brooklyn. And he literally went to the phone book and, and looked up a doctor's and got a doctor around the corner, called the doctor and said, I'm Arthur Miller, Marilyn, so could you please come over, please, quickly? And the doctor didn't believe him. He said, look, I'll come on the street and you'll see that it's me. He did. The doctor saved her mm. yet again. He came out and said to Arthur, she's going to be okay. Uh, I'll give her a sedative in a minute, something to make her sleep. And Arthur said, why didn't you give it to her? And the guy said, I want her autograph. <gasps> wow. And Arthur said he went in and picked up her hand and wrote her name on a piece of paper. Wow. Amazing. You know. This is going to be a hell of a book. Well, <laughs> that story's gone now. <laughs> a hell of a book and a hell of a performance. Thank you. Uh, Frank Langella as Richard Nixon and Frost Nixon, an unmissable performance in a great, great play, and we're very happy that Frank joined us tonight on Theater Talk. Thanks, both. Now, I'm interested that you use the term obstruction of justice. You perhaps have not read the statute with regard to the obstruction of justice. Well, as it happens, I have. Oh, you have, you say. Well, then, <clears throat> you'll know it doesn't just require an act. It requires a specific corrupt motive. And in this case, I didn't have a corrupt motive. 
what I was doing was in the interest of political containment. Well, be that as it may, the direct consequences of your actions would have been that two of the convicted burglars would have escaped criminal prosecution. Now, how can that not be a cover-up or obstruction of justice? I think the record shows, Mr. Frost, that far from obstructing justice, I was actively facilitating it. When Pat Gray of the FBI telephoned me, this is July 6th, I said, Pat, you go right ahead with your investigation. Now, that's hardly what you call obstructing justice. Well, that may be, but for two weeks prior to July 6th, we now know that you would...